just like a moth drawn to a flame Oh, you lured me in, I couldn't sense the pain <sighs> Okay, um, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to have this conversation um, For those of you who might uh, know, not know um, Tony um, uh, she sold. Uh, she started um, NYX Cosmetics. It's a it's a makeup brand from LA, and sold to um, L'Oreal in 2014. Um, I think she could give you the figures, <laughs> not the numbers. Um, but um, here's how I wish to start this conversation. Um, what inspired you to start your own company? Um, because I'm a consumer myself, I'm a makeup lover, and uh, I started the company when I was in my 20s, uh, and uh, uh, in my 20s, I didn't have a lot of money, so I used to go shop at the drugstores, and drugstore products are like, really bad, but at the same time, I used to go to department stores and look at all these wonderful products, and then I realized that I could close the gap, like there's a, there's a, a, a opportunity in the market to deliver a really great product at a really great price so that's why I wanted to start in NYX Cosmetics. Um, do, you, do you mind sharing like how you started in, in, in more details like what was your first product? Did you build your first product yourself? Yeah, so the first product, I started with uh, 18 SKUs. Uh, I started with cosmetic pencils. It was uh, six colors in eyeliner and 12 colors in lip liners. And uh, um, I started a very small 600 square foot showroom. I didn't even have a warehouse. Um, and uh, it was a complete bootstrap. I was the only person working. So it was a me, myself, and I company. I was the president, the CEO, the receptionist, the secretary. I deliver. I pass. Packed, I cleaned, I did everything from um, A to Z. You name it, I did it myself. And your first showroom was in LA? What's that? What's, was in LA? Yes, it was in LA, Los Angeles. Okay. All right. So I guess you bootstrapped for the first year? or? Yeah, um, it was to the point where I did not even have a receptionist. So when customers or anybody called to ask for me, I would actually answer the phone and I would say, hello, NYX Cosmetics. And if they asked for Tony Co., I would put them on hold, go back and come back and answer the phone. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, oh, yeah, I did that. And then um, once I went to a trade show, I met a really good supplier that I wanted to work with. And and they wanted to come and inspect the warehouse. The thing was that I did not have a warehouse. I just kind of pretended like my company was a little bigger than it really was. Right. So uh, when they told me that they were going to come to Los Angeles to have a meeting, I'm like, oh, my God, what do I do, right? So um, I said, you know what? I'm going to be out of, out of town on a business trip. So I cannot, I, like, I'm not able to meet you. So I used, to, I used to do a lot of that. But, you know, you fake it until you make it. Um, so when did you make your first hire then? Like, was it past like two years, three years term? Um, so it was a one person company for first one year and then I had uh, one and a half person for next 12 months and my major first hire was two years after the business started. So one and a half meaning half is freelance? Part time. Part time, okay. Yes. Got it. So um, you didn't raise any external funding? I did, but that was uh, that was uh, 2000. So I started the company in 1999. So that was like uh, almost 19 years after I started the company. Um, I had uh, I raised uh, 10 million dollars at that round, and that was the only round that I ever had. Wow. So um, wow. So for for those of you know the people that might not know, you know how much you sold the company and like. Which year? Uh, do you mind giving more detail about that? Um, so I have non-disclosure, so I can't <laughs> say the number, but it's very close to uh, half a billion dollars, 500 million. Yeah. Um, I remember reading an article about Tony, and he said, um, rumor to be 500 million. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, cool. Um, so, w w so you've been running the company for 17 years, correct? No, uh, I ran the company for 15 years. 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, what were the, like, the biggest challenges you faced when you were building your company? Um, the biggest challenge, uh, you know, as with all 
business and as with an entrepreneur, running a company is never easy, right? You have to build the right team. But the hardest aspect of the business for me was HR, human re like human relationship was the hardest for me. Um, and uh, also as the company company grew, um, I was hiring more people. The team was growing, and uh, I really needed to open a large chain drugstore market. So I would go to all these trade shows, and I would go to Walmart. I don't know if anybody knows. Walmart or CVS, but I would go to Walmart, uh, not Walmart, I'm sorry, I would go to Walgreens and then, you know, Walgreens buyer would ask, how much business do I do at uh, CVS? So then I would go to a CVS meeting and they would ask me how much business that I was doing with Walgreens. So it's like, it's like, like, how do you break into this market, right? So getting it, like, getting that first break was the hardest for me. And who was your um, first distributor that you work with? Uh, my first major account was this account called Ulta, U-L-T-A. If you are in a beauty business, you want to get into Ulta. They're great buyers. Right, right. Um, okay. And so were, were there any points that you wanted to give up? Mm, no, uh, quitting was never an option for me. Um, so I've, just, I've never thought about giving up or quitting. No. Um, okay. And uh, when did you know that your company was a strong path to success? That was about like 2007, 2008. Uh, this is when the first boom of social media really started to happen. Um, this is when like YouTube came along and like there were these bloggers and we had this one item. It was called JEP604. I still remember this. This JEP604. This color is called milk. It's a jumbo eyeshadow pencil that people that the uh, YouTubers use as a eyeshadow base, right? Um, but this item is a hero item. But back in 2007, 2008, this item was actually on a discontinued list because it was performing very, very, very low. And out of nowhere, we saw the sales increase. Like, it was crazy. Like, it went from, like, 5,000 pieces to 50,000 pieces, like, overnight. And 50,000 to 100,000, 200,000. The number just kept on growing. And we t we t in, the, in the beginning, we couldn't figure out why. And then, ding, 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 it ha like, we realized one day, oh, my God. Like these makeup bloggers are using this item as a as a eyeshadow base and doing a tutorial on it, and people are actually reacting to this. So uh, once we realize this, we're like, this is the next marketing. Um, like, this is what we need to do. So we started to see like all the YouTubers and um, immediately, and that's when I realized that this brand was going to be really big. Wow. Um, so were you able to keep up with the orders, like 50? 5,000 to 50,000, 100,000? Um, no, in the beginning, it was uh, sold out a lot. But actually, having your product being sold out on your website, it's, it kind of could work in an advantageous way. And uh, it's, a, it's actually sometimes we used to post to sold out on products that were not sold out. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess it's a great marketing. It, okay. it's marketing 101. Yeah. Um, so that was your like the first quantum jump. You know, I remember you you mentioning that you know the companies don't um, you know grow gradually, but they do quantum jumps um, you know from time to time. Um, so on your second and third and fourth product, did you? intend on using the social media marketing on the, on the products? Yeah, so uh, we've actually, in my company, we've never had a marketing department. We've, it was, it, we never had a traditional marketing department. And uh, what we did when we went out to the market to sell the company, we actually created a marketing department because we would go to all these buyers and these guys in suit, they just did not understand these uh, um, the social media marketing. So we had a PR department, and we kept explaining to these guys. We're like, this is not a traditional company. We don't have a marketing department. And they just scratched their head and like they looked like bewildered, right? So what we decided to do is, okay, we're gonna hire somebody and call it a marketing department. So we ended up creating a marketing department to sell the company. Wow. Um. <laughs> I guess it's, it's, it's the other way around from what I hear from um, other, you know, brand companies. Mm -hmm. um, then what were the, like, the numbers or the performance metrics that you focused on every day on the operations? 
On the operations, of course, you know, um, we look at our daily sales all the time. And uh, we were like, uh, uh, we had our own e-commerce, but our e-commerce was used to push the customers onto the brick and mortar stores. Because my company was, uh, it was a it was major majority wholesale business. It wasn't B2, B2C, it was B2B. So we did not want to take away the business from our customers. So um, our website was just a, um, uh, just sort of like a portal. But then we realized that the website business was the fastest growing business. So uh, we, once we decided that we were going to really grow the business, um, we really put a uh, pedal to the metal and grew it. Right. Um, yeah, I think depending on the CEO, they are, there are um, entrepreneurs that focus on the product, the marketing, or technology. So would you say you really focus on the product? Um, oh, too. absolutely. I mean, this is a consumer goods company. This is a beauty company. And uh, uh, one thing that we stand by was we had to deliver a great quality product at a great price point. And that was, that was our number one priority, no matter what. Wow. So, so um, how did you um, inspire your team to really be focused on those metrics as well? Say that again? How did you inspire your team like, to focus on the products as well? Um, because I always believe that it's my promise, it's our brand's promise to our consumers, right? And we have consumers dependent on buying NYX Cosmetics because when they buy that tube of lipstick, they know that it's only $5, $6, but they're going to get a good, great quality product. And when you have a promise like that to your consumers and uh, you deliver it every day consistently, I think that itself is an inspiration. And it's not me inspiring my team, it's our consumer who, who inspires my team. Right. But um, were there any employees that wanted marketing team in, in, the, in the company? No, I think everybody, no, everybody in, in my company, um, we all knew that um, this was not a traditional company. And then uh, our marketing was social media, not through a traditional marketing. Um, how big was your team when you sold to um, L'Oreal? Uh, we had about 250 50 people, um, about 50 to 60 was at office, and then the remainder was at our warehouse. We ran our own warehouse, and we ran our own logistics. Wow, wow. Um, yeah, um, so when you sold to L'Oreal, what factors did you consider when you, when you sold it? Yeah. The biggest concern for me was who's going to be the best custodian of the brand because as an entrepreneur i mean i lived and breathed this brand i mean like nyx cosmetic was part of me i was part of nyx cosmetic it was so very dear and important to me um it felt almost like sending your kid off to sending your firstborn child off to college. So who was going to be the best custodian of the brand? I really wanted to see this brand to be recognized as like, uh, you know, like Revlon one day. Like well, I want NYX Cosmetics to be... I guess it, be, it already is. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. I, want, I want this brand to be one day, every single woman in this world would know about this brand. That's what I wanted ultimately, right? So who was going to be the best custodian? That was the most important. Um, do you mind sharing how um, L'Oreal approached you and how they made the offer? Well, it was a beating process. Uh, I, it was, they did not approach us first. We approached them, um, but we had an auction process going on. So at the end, we had uh, two finalists. One was TPG, and one was uh, it's an, it's a uh, uh, VC company from San Francisco, and another one was L'Oreal. Um, they both had a very similar offer on the table, but ultimately I decided to sell the company to L'Oreal because um, as for the brand, I always knew that L'Oreal was, to, was going to be the best custodian. Wow. Um, so you decided not to stay with L'Oreal? No, uh, I'm an <laughs> entrepreneur. <laughs> I would make a, I would, you know, I know myself. I'd be a very terrible employee. I don't like people telling me what to do at all. So, uh, and I wasn't going to sell a company to work for somebody. 
So it was very, like, I, I made it very clear from day one that the day I get paid is the last day that I would, I would stay on with the brand. And I have prepared for it two years prior. So um, I had to hire a CFO, CEO, a product development person. It was, I mean, I was building the company to be sold for over two years. And I was slowly phasing myself out of the business. Um, I wanted to make sure that the company was self-running uh, by the time that I sold the company and uh, it was really good because L'Oreal they signed the contract they sent the money I got <laughs> I got paid and I walked away everything that I wanted Wow um, so I think this goes back a little but why why did you decide to sell I've always wanted to sell the company. I was not, I've always known that I was not building a legacy company. So from day one, I was very clear on my strategy to build a brand and to sell the company one day. Um, yeah, um, Tony and I were uh, talking in the backstage that um, she may be the first speaker on this stage, first female speaker on this stage. So um, did you encounter any difficulties when, um, you know, you're running the company as a female entrepreneur? No, not really. You know, um, the thing is that I never consider myself to be a female in a man's world. It's always kind of my world and men are in it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I grew up in an environment where a lot of, a lot of women were working. My mother was a working mother. And so it was just very natural to me that I work and I just never, like, it's all in your head, right? If you constantly tell yourself there that you're a woman in a man's world, then it's going to be. And, uh, you know, um, I think at the same time, there's a lot of advantage being a woman it's actually a lot more fun it's actually a <laughs> and there's a, there's actually a lot more advantage too oh, what are the advantages that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know um, women are there's uh, women are a lot more compassionate that's a that's a proven fact and as we know that being compassionate is a great part of being a leader uh, that's number one a, a woman has great intuition and intuition is always good because I know that I ran my business on my intuition as well and every time I felt something wrong definitely there was something wrong so for those reasons it's fantastic being a female entrepreneur great, great. Um um, female entrepreneurship is a big topic in the valley. It is, yeah, it is a big topic in the valley. So um, do you have any words um, to, to share with the audience? Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, um, stamina, especially for women. Stamina is very important. You need to compete, right? So I say you need to exercise and eat healthy always have to always have energy and then number two would be to always constantly ask yourself whether you're in a comfortable situation and if you're ever in a comfortable situation you're in the wrong place um, I think it's very important for everybody to con continuously put yourself in uncomfortable situation because that's the only way you're gonna grow as a person and that's the only way you're gonna grow as a business entrepreneur as well okay. um, this would be my last question and um, have you said your next journey yet? Ever? Yes, I have, actually. Um, so when I sold my company, um, I sold the company because I thought I wanted to retire. I ran the company for 15 years, and I really thought I wanted to just drink margarita by the beach and lay out and enjoy, the, <laughs> enjoy life. That's what I thought. And uh, I, the very next day, after I sold the company, um, I thought I was gonna go like and pop champagne and have fun, but I felt like a balloon that was that just got like popped and like depleted. So I went home, I slept for 10 hours like straight. I woke up and I went, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I like, there's no reason for me to wake up. And I felt like I lost my self identity and I like, I was like, I was like, who am I? I was like really depressed for the first three months. So um, I started to look for another 
category of business that I could get into. Um, and July 31, 2014 is the day I sold my business. August 1, 2015, I started a company. So exactly 12 months later, I started another company. And uh, it's still pre-launch. We're going to be launching in April, but it's going to be a, it's a, it's a fun project. Wow, great. Um, yeah, th um, thank you for sharing your um, you know, personal and professional story. Um, it's, it was great to have you uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.